yeah, wow. I mean, you know, unbeknownst to me, man, it was just one of those things where um, I was like, you know, I, I used to see parent uh, and student relationships. I'm like, okay, note yourself, don't do this. <laughs> All right, note yourself, make sure you do that, you know, so on and so forth. So um, I'm not saying I'm, I'm perfect by any stretch, but I realized what it what my job wasn't uh as a parent um and i realized that you know i had to take the coach hat off and the teacher hat off and i had to be Welcome dad to beyond the ball podcast what's going on what's going on what's going on ballers Welcome to another episode of the Beyond the Ball podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Jones. And for those of you all who this might be your first time tuning in, the premise of Beyond the Ball is ultimately focusing on helping student athletes succeed beyond their degree. And we cover stories, strategies, and successes to help them do that. If you have not taken the time to connect and subscribe to the podcast, I would encourage you to do just that, especially on YouTube, because you know you get to see our guests' beautiful faces you know, the beautiful and handsome faces. So make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, but now we got the preliminaries out of the way. Now I'm excited to bring to the stage, I, I guess we have a very special guest in the building. Uh, he goes by the name of Coach Rice the Third. He's an educator, he's a coach, and he's a speaker. Welcome to Beyond the Ball, Coach Rice. How you feeling? Brother Jonathan Jones, great morning, man. Thank you so much for having me. I just appreciate the opportunity to come in. And, and it's always a pleasure talking to you, man. It's always a pleasure. <laughs> likewise, man, likewise. If smooth was a picture in the dictionary, it probably would be you. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> Listen, man, I'll send a check. And where should I, who, what address should I send a check to? I don't know who's endorsed. I need to, I, you, I'm, I'm clearly a, a paying you to say this stuff, man. <laughs> <laughs> Coach Rice, man, uh, I'm, I'm I'm glad to have you on. And then just for everybody who might not be um, familiar with you just as of yet, please go ahead take take a little bit of time and you know give give the people a snapshot of of who you are and 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 yeah, just just take a little bit of time. Absolutely. Again, George E. Rice III is my given name. Uh, there were two before me. There is one after me. My son is George Rice IV, uh, originally from the glass city of Toledo, Ohio. Uh, as Dick Vitale actually once coined us and crowned us one of, he called us the basketball haven of Ohio long ago. Um, but I grew up there, went to Morehouse College for undergrad. I have a degree in psychology, uh, a bachelor's in psychology and a master's in mental health counseling from Bowling Green State University in Ohio. Uh, after I left college, I, I started a career as an educator. I uh, started on teaching middle school math and science. Uh, from there, I started uh, I started coaching literally probably after my first. Well, actually, I, I coached actually before I went to college, but I started coaching, coaching after I started teaching. Uh, and so I taught middle school math and science for four and a half years. And I moved into the higher ed realm, uh, worked in trio programs with the upper bound program, um, pre-college programs. And then from there, moved into multicultural affairs. So I've been in I've been a student affairs pro for 20 years uh, and educated for 20 years. Uh, and a speaker full time um, for the last two years. Um, but I've had my business, Triple Third Enterprises LLC, which is an education consulting company based here in the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. Uh, it's been around since March of 2009. And so uh, two years ago, I finally just decided to take the leap. And life has been absolutely amazing since, man. Man, yeah, yeah. 20 years? I didn't know you had 20 years in the education space. Brother, it's a blur. You turn around once and literally they're like, hey, man, you've been here a while. <laughs> but, you know, I tell people, even though I tried to run from education or being an educator, it was in my bloodline um, on my father's side. Um, let's see. There, matter of fact, I'm looking at my ancestors now because I have a picture in my office. Uh, my grandfather was one of 14 children. Um, and out of the 14 children, um, 10 of them were able to go to college. Mm. Uh, my grandfather was not, he was one of the four that did not, um, but still he served honorably in the military or, or what have you, um, along with several of his brothers and sisters, um, that did not necessarily finish school N either way. Um, I tried to run from being an educator, not realizing it was in my blood. I thought I was supposed to do something that made more money or more prestige. And I realized, no, I'm wired for this. And so uh, my junior year of college, between my junior and senior year of, of college in Morehouse, I worked at 
a group home for young men. And I was just a math tutor at first. And then I was upgraded to one of the counselors there. And I saw that I really had a, a heart for mentoring and coaching young people. And so the bug bit me before I realized it. <laughs> and so, you know, senior year, I was interviewing for all these positions, you know, corporate stuff, you know, I'm getting dressed up every Friday wearing a suit. Oh man, it must be interview time, especially senior year. Um, only to interview pretty well, but then realize this wasn't a fit. Corporate wasn't a fit. And no, just to corporate, it just wasn't a fit. Um, yeah, I could have been trained to do a job, but I'm not sure if I would have been as fulfilled as I've been. And so I always tell people, even though I graduated from college 20 years ago, um, I feel like I never graduated um, because, again, I'm 137 years old, man. Um, <laughs> you know, I, but, but I, I tell people I remain, I feel that I remain young because I've worked around young people all my professional career. And honestly, the the beauty of me embracing that I am an educator and a coach. And again, I'm, I'm a third generation coach. My grandfather was a baseball coach. <laughs> mm. So um, once I embrace that, um, you know, I, I tell people, you know, working with young people help me raise my children. Wow. Yeah, wow. I mean, you know, unbeknownst to me, man, it was just one of those things where, um, I was like, you know, I, I used to see parent uh, and student relationships. I'm like, okay, note to self, don't do this. <laughs> All right, note to self, make sure you do that, you know, so on and so forth. So um, I'm not saying I'm, I'm perfect by any stretch, but I realized what it what my job wasn't uh, as a parent. Um, and I realized that, you know, I had to take the coach hat off and the teacher hat off and I had to be dad. You know, I, I couldn't be Coach Rice all the time. It's like, nah, you got to be dad at home. And dad outside of the home, you know, to your own children and ultimately a surrogate father, uncle, older cousin, older brother to some of my former students. So, man, it's, it's been a joy. I, I literally tell people I, I I embrace the best ministry that I know of and that was fit for me. Yeah, you said, wow, working with young people helped you raise your kids. Mm hmm. <laughs> true story <laughs> man that's so prolific so powerful and even at the yeah. same time as, as i'm hearing you say that that definitely rings true because you have to you have to know the pulse of the people that you're working with mm -hmm. and if you don't know the pulse then you'll then you'll be numb yeah that's true and what's funny what's cool about it is of course you know you and i grew up in the hip-hop era so what was cool about it is that you know, our parents didn't necessarily, they didn't necessarily dig up up. They didn't think it was true art, a true art form, right? At first <laughs> versus where me and my kids are pretty much listening to the same music. So it's not like, you know, there may be a song or two that may come on on the radio. Now I don't want to hear it because I think it's trash. Right. But very, I mean, it's, it's a very short list. Right. So I think that gave me an advantage being an educator, being, being ever connected to the lingo, to the trends in fashion, to the trends in, in the latest sayings, to who was hot, who was not on the music scene. Um, that was that was helpful. I was immersed in it. And so having one foot in my own generation and, and my next foot in, in the in the up and coming generation has always been my advantage. I feel that's been, that's been my advantage the entire time. Like I won't allow myself to ever be older than 25. I just won't. <laughs> I just refuse it. <laughs> <laughs> why is that though? Why 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 is that, Coach Rice? You what in terms of why 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 are you going to allow yourself to be older than twenty five? Well, because I feel like we're not our age; we're our energy, and I feel I'm in better shape now at twenty five plus, <laughs> mentally, physically, spiritually than I was when I was actually twenty five, um, which was just last year. So, <laughs> but no, I, I mean, I, I think it's important for us to be our energy and not our age. You know, people say aging number, the number it's a number, but that number really only tells us exactly how long we've been blessed. Mm. Right. It tells us exactly how long we've been blessed, but it it's no indication of what our energy is. You know, I have both both of my grandfathers who are both transit who are both transitioned now, both live to be 90 plus. Right. Um, and they were very similar. They're, they're actually 11 years apart. <laughs> um, my, my mother's father was born September 11th, 1911. My namesake, George Sean, was born September 3rd, 1922. Right. Both of them live to be 90 plus. Um, both, both very honorable men. 
for the most part, in pretty good health for the better part of their lives. My mother's father more so than my than my namesake, um, because <laughs> quite frankly, my mother's father would obey what the doctor told him. And, <laughs> and my grandfather's 99 years. He never had a cavity, <laughs> which I think is one of the most uh, impressive things. But again, he and my grandmother were were, were farmers in the deep south. Uh, all my family's from Huntsville, Alabama. Um, and so I was raised in the Midwest with Southern, with very, very, very Southern values. You know, you say, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. You open the door for people. Uh, matter of fact, I, I learned that gentlemen opened the door for women in kindergarten. And ever since then, I just never, I've never gone through the door before a female or a woman ever, ever. <laughs> and it was funny as a kid, people, oh my God, that's, but I, I, I remember learning that even before I went to kindergarten. And so, um, you know, being, being a, of sound mind, I always feel like, and, and again, because my father, you know, was also, you know, he was raised in Ohio, but with Southern values, um, he was always a person that spoke to people. And so I really understood what it, what it meant to be a, a gentleman, like in all sense of the word, a gentleman, I was a gentleman first, then eventually I was a scholar. Um, but you know, it's, it's just one of those things where, um, you know, I feel like we, we are our energy. We're not our age. And, uh, I just, I live that way. And, and until I can, until, until the creator says, Hey man, it ain't time for you to keep moving. I'm going to keep moving. Y'all going to see me in the gym at 85, getting it in. Like I, this is, this is a lifestyle. My mom said <laughs> when I get married on our video, she said, don't start doing anything you don't want to do for the rest of your life. And as a coach, I'm like, I've got to model the health side. I, the, I have to model the lifestyle. I can't tell certain people if it's clients or if it's former players, I can't tell you to do certain stuff if I'm not willing to do it. Mm. And that's really the ultimate goal of coaching, trying to model the way. And then your clients or your, or your players or your former athletes, they make their decision based on how you move or how you don't move. Again, we're all created with free will. And so I think that's been the joy in coaching, watching my, not only watching my former players grow into their manhood, and womanhood, because I have coached uh, coach girls AAUs for a couple of summers too, um, watching them grow into their adulthood and do or say things that maybe they heard me and my coaching staff, staff say, either to their children. And a lot of my players now, my former players are coaching, which to me is is absolutely amazing because I get a chance to sit in the sands when I go home and just watch. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm like, man, y'all were really paying attention. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> What's it like being able to take that step back, knowing that you've created a coaching tree, mm. right? So seeing, you know, that you, for those people who might not be familiar with the term coaching tree, mm. it's basically just taking the aspect of if, if, if Coach Rice, you know, he, he, he's, a, he's a tree, then as the branches grow out, former players that he worked with, former athletes that he worked with, now seeing them coach and work with other athletes. But Coach Rice, what's that like be, being able to see your fruit? Man, it defies description. Uh, one of one of my former players has been a girls and a boys coach at the high school level, and he's a minister. He's I mean he's he's married. He's he's got children. He's just doing phenomenal, phenomenal things. And it's just it's I can't I can't find a word in the dictionary or the source to actually explain it. Like you know, in one word, proud is of course an obvious statement, but I really look at their evolution, right? When did they get bit by the bug that says, Hey, this is where your gifts are needed, right? When, what, what experience did you have? Was it a good, bad or a different experience? And the creator said, no, nah, man, I need you here. Like, I want you here with these young people. I want you imparting some sort of wisdom or knowledge into these young people. And of course, a lot of people look at coaches as people who talk loud and give directives and so on and so forth. Yeah, it's, it's kind of part of the job description. <laughs> but I tell people, I've been coaching basketball for 20, 20 plus years, but I stopped coaching basketball about 10 years ago. Um, I really feel like we coach character. Mm. Sport just happens to be there for the ride. That's the vehicle, right? That's the platform. Like the sport is the platform. The mission is character. I look at what, they tell their players as they break the huddle for practice, not even for games and how some of the things are simply cyclical, <laughs> you know, from scholar, well, from team member at home, right. From family member to scholar to teammate. Right. And then from teammate 
to sister or brother. And I tell my players all the time, if all you got out of our time together was a teammate, then I failed. Mm. If you play for me, this is a brotherhood or a sisterhood. Your parents are my family. Your siblings are my family. Your grandparents are my family. And my family is your family. So there are players now that are asking about my kids. Hey, man, what's Taylor up to? Because Taylor, my daughter, matter of fact, it was I started coaching a year before she was born. So they always remember Taylor as barely being able to walk coming to the games. Right. And honestly, real quick, quick story. My first championship, I, I'll never forget, man. Um, we were, you know, I took my guys down. We were ready. To, we were getting dressed. All of a sudden they knock on the door. Hey, man, what's going on? I'm like, what's going on? Man, my daughter got sick and threw up <laughs> and threw up. I'm mean, like, man, she's really sick. We're going to have to either go home or rush to the hospital. So I'm like, what? We can right, yo, we can right hit the floor. Like, <sighs> so it was one of those things where, you know, um, you know, my wife, you know, they, they didn't get a chance to see, they didn't chance, get a chance to see the game. And uh, it was just one of those things where, you know, I just had to push forward. And, and honestly, you know, my, my players, I, I tell you what, you know, we, we talk about when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I'm saying that right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, some of my most pivotal moments as a coach have been in my moments of vulnerability. Um, that was one that got to me. Cause like literally, man, we were five minutes from, from hitting, hitting the floor to do warmups and she had to leave. And I'm like, my God, my daughter had never been sick before. So as we get ready to pray for the game, man, I, I'm, I, man, I'm, I just tears running down my face, man. I, I'm just trying to get through it. I'm just, I'm, I'm like praying for the safety of my daughter, health and safety of my daughter, my family, unless Lord, let's just go out here and remember everything that we've been able to do. We're not asking for a victory. We're just asking for the the, the lesson that that is deservedly ours. And uh, boom, we take the floor. We win the championship. And you know she was okay. It was like twenty four hour virus. It was two year old stuff. You know what I'm saying? And but but again, they remember that. They remember my daughter coming in and you know chasing after the ball. They remember my son coming in, um, looking like he was going to be a hooper. But neither one of them ended up being hoopers, which is okay because I didn't force the game on them. But they become a part of my family and I become a part of theirs. And so to me, beyond the games that we won and, you know, from AU, we're traveling down and winning tournaments and competing. I just really, I miss the camaraderie of the families, you know, really getting to know the families, getting to know what some of my players are like when they're not at practice, you know, get to see how, <laughs> get to see how some of their, <laughs> their living, their living skills are <laughs> when they're not, when they're not at home. <laughs> Which is all, which is always uh, interesting, uh, you know, again, and, and you, you just hope at some point you impart some sort of what knowledge and wisdom on it and they actually apply it at some point down the line. Certainly, certainly. Yeah, the, you, de you definitely have to, you know, apply the apply the intangibles uh, and traveling with people that you never travel with is very, very interesting to, to say the least. It's very interesting. <laughs> Yeah, you know. Yeah, you know it all too well. <laughs> Man, yeah. You, you know, because people people on these trips and they're like, oh, no, nah, mom's not here, dad's not here. Whoop, whoop, yeah. whoop. And it all goes the out the door. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, I, I tell people that's that's the mission of coaching, though, to train, not only to train, but to empower young people. In other words, here's something I do even now. I tell my guys when we get in the huddle, I I'll say who's playing what position. Here's my starting five. You know we're in on a make. You're, you know we're in on a miss. You know the first play from, from out of bounds that we're running. It's done. I said, I make myself a deal. I don't say anything for the first five minutes. Not one thing. Not one thing. They know what we're running. If need be, all I have to do is hold up to number four. That's, that's the inbounds play we're running. I don't say anything for the first five minutes. Because that's what practice is for. <laughs> you had a chance to ask questions during practice. You know how to play the game. It's my goal not to get in your way. <laughs> but at the same time, it's your goal not to get in my way. <laughs> I want you to do your job. It's my job to not get in the way of you doing your job. And it's your job to not get in the way of me doing mine. Because if I don't win games, I don't keep my job. <laughs> if you don't win games... Hey, you gotta, you gotta, hopefully you have somewhere to live 
hey, I could lose my job, brother. You just don't know. But but I always tell them, I said, you know, um, it's not my job to teach you the fundamentals. You can make a layup. You can make a bounce pass. You can make a chess pass and so on and so forth. Can you think and play? And that's why I say character is what we teach them. That's the that's the mission, because we teach them how to make decisions, informed decisions, not just decisions. Um, and again, it's all applicable. Of course, the discipline and the hard work and the perseverance and the resilience comes along for the ride. But it's really incumbent and mandatory of us to make sure that we are instilling in them character, not necessarily always by what we say, but by what we do. So those first five minutes that I'm quiet, I'm like, you correct your own mistakes. <laughs> if somebody's not in the right position, you tell them. If we're not in the right defense, now, if it gets out of line, now, trust me, uh, Jonathan Jones. <laughs> it's my rule. If it's three uncontested baskets, oh, we get a timeout. I mean, the 20 is, the 20 is still here, right? <laughs> The fool is here. Oh, time out. That's the first thing. That's the only thing I'll say. But if we're rolling, there are stops in the game where we can just make adjustments. But I don't say anything. Everybody now the, the players can say stuff. But everybody on my staff, I'm like, be quiet. Let's see how they work through this, and see who see who the leader is as they emerge and and whatever scenario. If it's the defensive end, if it's the offensive end, do they need to make attitude adjustments amongst their teammates? And so everybody has an opportunity to speak up. And so I really feel like. Um, matter of fact, my man, um, my man, Kyle Adams said something. He was on my podcast. He's on the podcast that's coming up, uh, this season. He said something, our game is overcoached and undertaught. Mm. <laughs> wow. And he says, that's not his. He quoted it from somebody else, but I was like, wow. He says, our game is overcoached and undertaught and it couldn't be truer. And that's a perfect example of what I would do and that what I would still do. Like, no, y'all, this is why we practiced. Make the adjustment. You need to know. Say, 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 I say I get sick. Say we get held up in traffic. You should be able to, you should be able to start the game. You should, you know how to play this game. You know what the expectation is. We've mm. been practicing, we've been practicing expectations the entire time. So all you do in the game is you either meet or exceed the expectation, period. Win, lose, or draw. Play hard, play smart, have fun. That was, those are my rules. That's it. If you do the first two, the third is on the way. Wow. Yeah, and I, I, I think that I think that's that's, that's funny because I can remember back when I was in junior college, and then there would be sometimes we would come in, and the first time we were waiting for coach to get started with practice, and then he was like, "I don't know why y'all waiting on me." We go through the same thing every day. We do the stretches, and after the stretches, then we we do some form shooting. Then we mm -hmm. do this, then we do that. Y'all know what we do every day. You don't mm -hmm. need me to mm -hmm. be the one to kick off to, to kick off practice and, and start like that. So, yeah, there's yeah. a lot of <laughs> a lot of truth there. <laughs> but but where did all where did these principles get get embedded in in, in your mind right because you didn't you know you just didn't you mm -hmm. didn't go from gentleman to scholar and then this boiled True. over to the basketball court as well like how, where, where, did, where did this come from for for you and taking on these principles and these life lessons man listen i made the i made the cardinal mistake of doing too much i was over coaching and under teaching the game um distinctly Again, this is another vulnerable moment. This is my first season coaching. <laughs> uh, so best season ever, even though we didn't win a championship. Best season ever because I learned so much and I made so many adjustments by what my players didn't say. So, I mean, we're just, man, we couldn't throw a P in the C, right? So we're at our we're at our crosstown rival. <laughs> Last game of the regular season. This particular game is going to determine where we seed in the City League playoffs. So... Man, we stinking it up, Jonathan Jones. We are stinking the place up. And we're at our rival. It's loud in there. It's nasty. It's stinky in there. And we really stinking it up by the way we're playing. I call a timeout. I start yelling at my guys. And I'm sure I was turning red. Um, and the look on their faces um, was just like, dang, coach, we we giving you everything. Right. And they didn't say anything. And literally, it was divine intervention. I literally heard, it wasn't my assistant coach. <laughs> it, it, it wasn't the referee. <laughs> it wasn't my parents who were always never far from my, from my bench. 
I heard a voice say, talk to them. And in that moment, I'm not lying. It's loud as a mug in the gym. Jonathan Jones, I talked this loud. I said, all right, fellas, here's what we're going to do. Made a couple of substitutions. I said, okay, this is what we're in. This is what, on, this is what we're in on a miss. This is what we're in on a make. One, two, three, go. And these dudes went on a 15 to two run. We ended up losing by three points. But I was like, got it. What I didn't realize is our young men have been yelled at for so long. Mm. Our young people have been yelled at for so long. They forget that they're human. So if they forget that they're human, it's hard for them to be human to anybody else. And I was like, as a coach, I've got to realize I make mistakes. And when I make mistakes, I need to own them. And so I am pretty sure I am the first man that they that my former players ever had apologized to them in spirit and truth and looked them all in the eyes and say, hey, guys, I apologize. And it seemed like the more vulnerable I became, the harder they played for me. And for themselves and for their and for their brothers next to them and for their families that are sitting in the stands. And so I literally just learned by doing less coaching and more connecting. Mm. Right. Because we could teach the fundamentals. Do as I do. And as I say, however, when I don't say anything, do what you know you're supposed to do and correct yourself if need be. And, you know. Being somebody who realizes that everybody is a teacher, the wise is I, I realized through coaching that the wisdom is not reserved for the people that are older. Mm -hmm. There are things that our nieces and nephews at two and three understand about video games and cartoons that we don't know. <laughs> right. There are things that dogs understand that we don't. <laughs> right? mm -hmm. There are things that we understand that our grandparents don't and vice versa. And so I was like, no, this is an opportunity for me to really learn what it's like to play for a coach like me. So I always put myself on the other side of it. How did he hear you say that coach? I know you said it, but what did you mean? Mm -hmm. And so practice was always an opportunity for us to connect, not just coach, because what I would do instead of just give instructions, what I do is not just give instructions. I ask questions. I say, when you come to practice, don't come to win. Come to learn, learn something new today about yourself, <laughs> you know, learn something about yourself physically, mentally, learn more about me, learn more about the brother next to you, right? Or the sister next to you, find out what it is you do well or that you don't do well and where can you get the help? And that's why I say team sports is one of the best things ever invented because it allows us all to be as strong as our vulnerability. Right. Because we talk about help side defense. Mm -hmm. And I used to tell I used to, I used to grab my best defender and I would be like, all right, man, you are hands down. You are our best defenders. Anybody argue? OK, whatever. That's we, we can play one on one later. <laughs> I said, but guess what? There's only so much that you can do as a defender. You can't completely shut me down. At some point, you're going to need help. However, the person who's playing alongside of you needs to know when your breaking point could possibly happen so they could help early and often. Right. And so I said, so apply this to when you don't understand something in class, there's going to be something that you don't understand. Even a 4.0 student is going to raise their hand and be like, yo man, I don't understand that. Right. <laughs> At some point you're going to need help. I don't care what sport you play. And in, and in life, we're going to need help. Um, you know, I, I tell the people stories about, you know, I tell the story of when I almost drowned when I was six years old, man. Um, and I realized, you know, all I I, I, wrote, I raised my hand and somebody pulled me out the water. I didn't say anything. And so, um, you know, I hope that what we teach them day in and day out is the ability to communicate. And so the system is simple. You know, I tell guys, whether on offense or defense, my system is simple. Read, communicate, help, and then execute. Right. It applies to life. Right. Read. There's something in front of you that's giving you a sign. Right. What is it? What's it telling you to do? Where can you go? Where can't you go? What can you do? What can't you do? Right. Communicate. OK, I understand it or I need help. 
There's no middle of the ground. There's no middle ground. <laughs> either you understand it or you don't. Help, right? Either, either be the help or ask for help. Mm. And once you do that, you execute whatever is in front of you, whatever the fundamental is in front of you. And the more, like I said, the more I coach, the less I coach basketball. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's good. That's, that's, that's good, Coach Rice. That's, that's good. So now we, we have to transition. And, and, and I want to talk to you a little bit because um, you're, you're, you're talking about, about coaching. You're talking about teaching. Mm -hmm. You're talking about ultimately educating. So you happen to have a, a podcast. Talk, talk to us a little bit, a little bit about your podcast and, let, and introduce it to the good people. Yes, sir. The Coach to Coach podcast. It is on all listening platforms. Um, basically, everybody that I have on is a coach and they're not necessarily a coach in any particular sport. So we have business coaches. We have uh, weight loss coaches. We have business uh, business coaches. We have resume coaches. Anybody who's in the coaching profession, personal coaches, they're in. And so what I do is we just kind of dig in, you know, what's their philosophy? What's their style? What brought them to coaching? Um, how do how do they shift and make sure that they stay ahead of the curve of either their players or their clients or the people that they serve? And so I've had a lot of fun. Um, the first season I edited and I recorded and edited myself. That is the last season I will edit it. Uh, <laughs> Not just just because of it. it's so time consuming, um, but I had I had a lot of fun doing it. Um, I just had some amazing conversations. My my uh, two of my coaching mentors have been guests. Uh, some people that I've met on Instagram, I was like, no, nah, they would be a great guest. Boom. Had them on. And uh, it, it runs the gamut from um, from a sister who's a, a corporate, you know, she's a corporate coach to uh, a brother I know who's going to be in the second season. Uh, he's actually a strength and conditioning coach now for the Philadelphia 76ers. So um, I'm always open to, to, to coaches. It doesn't matter. And it just so happens this is a shameless plug. Uh, eventually, you know, I'm just hoping that either either or all of these people will be listening. Um, Doc Rivers, who is actually my coach. I mean, he's actually my cousin, uh, as well as Maurice Cheeks. Uh, they are both coaches in the NBA and I believe both NBA Hall of Famers. Um, mm -hmm. I would love to have either one of my cousins on my podcast. So if y'all ever hear this, I would just love to get y'all on the podcast <laughs> along with Coach Izzo and Coach K. But anyway, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, we, we have a lot of fun. Really, it, it's interesting to hear everybody's journey to coaching. Um, and, and again, women's coaches at the high school and college level. Uh, it's, it's just great to hear everybody's journey because the major, the major coaching, the major question I ask every guest is, did you choose coaching or did coaching choose you? And the answers run the gamut. And, um, you know, um, you know, I always knew I was a fan of coaches. Some people are a fan of players and teams. I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of players. I'm a fan of teams, but I'm really a fan of coaches. I have been for a long time and I've watched and, and I tell people there are a lot of coaches that I've watched particularly and i've been to coaches clinics and i watch how they do drills and i watch how they teach and so i'm constantly in the lab trying to figure out how can i how can i coach less and connect more that's always my thing i'm like listen i i don't care if i have players and i've had players that have played overseas um i played at d1 and d2 level and played overseas but i'm like i i, I you know if you all end up coaching that's when that's when i really want to come see you <laughs> Because I want to see how you're teaching. I want to see how you're connecting with your players. Mm, yeah, I think it's been. I think there's been a break in in the level of connection based on philosophy, philosophy of what coaching is from, mm -hmm. you know, from the coach and then from the person in the stands. Right. Like we're watching like, oh, no, wait, did the coach Izzo just do that? Right. And And then in connection with. <laughs> <laughs> so so the connection so i think there's just been a break ultimately in in what we see and what we think we understand from the outside mm -hmm. looking in mm -hmm. but then even in addition to that i i, I think there's also j just some things there's things that can easily be misconstrued mm -hmm. but when it, when it comes to coaching I, I think the proof is in the pudding ultimately when you see these players five years down the line 10 years down the line 12 years down the line you see what the former athlete is now doing mm -hmm. and you see, are they a law abiding citizen? Are they somebody who is, you know, a leader in this way or that way? I think that speaks directly back to what the coach invested in that player at that time. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you know even, even the ones who may not make the best informed decisions, um, they've had some sort of beginning mm. uh, 
that, you know, maybe it started before they got to the college ranks or the professional ranks, but they, they understand uh, the expectation. They understand the consequences and repercussions of things that happen. And hopefully they have a great enough relationship with their coaches that they can hear them on in their, in the back of their heads. Like, Hey man, what you doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. certainly, certainly. And then also coach Rice, I, I know you, I know you had something else that, that you want, that you wanted to share with us. You had something else you want that you want to share with the people. Oh, what about, well, I shared the podcast. I also have a book. I am, I am a published author, author, uh, my first book is called Rebound for Success, Five Ways to Turn Adversity into Your Accomplice. Um, it is available on Amazon. Um, you know, that book was, it wasn't difficult to write. It was difficult to let go of. Because <laughs> mm. uh, it was written, it was done, done. Like manuscript was done in probably 2015, 2016. Um, I didn't send it to get published until 2018. And that's a whole other story about, you know, just, you know, it's your thoughts on paper. It's, it's your it's your baby. And that first one is, is always the hardest one to get out. Uh, but that one wasn't necessarily just for it's not just for athletes. I, I, I hope that there are some gems in that book that people can take and apply to their lives. Um, and I, I really my challenge is really for people to look at adversity, not as something that's it. That's your um, uh, th that's your opponent. You know, adversity is actually your teammate, whether you realize it or not. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people, you know, you're people at the beginning of the year, yo, you know, I'm gonna get my summer body back or I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna do this. Or I'm gonna get in shape. I'm gonna get a financial shape. I'm gonna get a better physical shape. I'm gonna better get in better mental shape. And then they get the coach and the coach really says, look, you got to do this work. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm like, yeah, that's the adversity. Um, but I always, I don't know anybody that adversity has not benefited. And so that's why I say, let's turn adversity into our accomplice, something that's going to help us versus something that's going to always um, be against us. And yeah, it may push back and may de adversely definitely pushes back. It pulls, it twists you. Um, but it's actually your friend and a coaching mentor of mine told me this a long time ago. He was reading the reader's digest. We, we had a beef about something I can't remember. And so I went over just so we could squash it and have a sit down. And he, he says, he says, rice, check this out. And it was in the, it was in a reader's digest and uh shout out to Cornell Tally. He says, uh, the 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 quote was really simple. He says, "A true a true friend will stab you in the front." Mm. And um, when I got that, I said, "Okay." He taught me a lot about brotherhood by saying less and doing more, and and I respect him to this day because he taught me a lot of the nuances. Matter of fact, he's mentioned in in the in the beginning of the book. Um, he somebody told me a lot about just player development, um, skill development, and then connecting. Um, in, in my own particular way. So super grateful. Uh, second book is coming out. God willing, uh, June of this year. Uh, I mean, it's done. It's with my editor. Uh, I just got to put some finishing touches on it. This one is geared towards college freshmen. Um, and, and we're just, we're, I mean, I'm excited about it. I hope people get from it what they need to get of it out of it. It's a smaller book. It's a quick read. It's, it's what I call a tabletop book. The name of that is called um, The Five Files That Every College Freshman Commits. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's just based on it's based on my experience in the 20 plus years that I've had working in the higher ed, higher ed field. Uh, just just some quick things to get. Number one, the student to slow down. But more importantly, for the parents to slow down. Because mm -hmm. sometimes as parents and again, like I said, my students have helped me raise my children. When it came time for decisions, I gave both of my children the opportunity to say, look, do you need do you need a gap year? Just, you know, because we're made to go to school, you know, you go to school because that's what the law says. And your parents said, no, you go to school. <laughs> but I said, do you need a gap year? And my daughter was, you know, she had some challenges around her junior year, sophomore, junior high school. And by the time she got to her senior, she's like, no, dad, I'm ready to go. It's all right. Let's go. So as we stand now, she's a she's an alumna of Hampton University. Her home by the sea as the class of 2020 she just finished her first semester in her master's of social work program and i must say my baby girl got a 4.0 i'm super proud of her uh wow. my son graduated from high school last year um did really well got into every college he applied to got scholarships to two well he got into every college he applied to except for one um which was his first choice right but got scholarship offers several places um, but because I was able to connect with my son, he came to me before it was time to make the decision. He says, dad, yo, can we talk? I'm like, yeah, he says, I'm not sure if I'm ready to go to a four-year institution already. I mean, right off the bat, I said, okay, no problem, son. I said, 
let's talk about it. I said, he, I said, what do you think? And so he says, well, I think I'm going to go to a two-year college for a little bit and kind of see where that leads me, whatever, whatever. Fine. So I said, well, look, do you need to take a gap year where you, and then of course the pandemic hit. I said, you need to take a gap year where you just work. You don't go to school. I said, so you have four options. You can work, not go to school. You can go to school, not work. You can work part-time, go to school part-time, or if you want, you can pursue, you can pursue entrepreneurship. You have four choices. What do you want to do? He mm -hmm. says, okay. I said, all right, well, look, I said, you have at least a year to figure out where it is you think you want to go or what it is you want to try. But it was, and trust me, he got into my alma mater Morehouse. I didn't make him go. I didn't say, no, you got to go to a four-year institution. Uh -uh. The way I learned that is through former players and their parents, because I've sat across some students and student athletes who are in school right now. And this is for those students and not, this is for those student athletes and just students, period, who are studying something that they have to study because their parents said, doctor, lawyer, engineer, and it's not in their wheelhouse. It's not something that they're passionate about. And again, we're brought to, we're brought up to respect our parents and, and we, and rightfully so. However, parents relax a little bit at 18. I don't care what you say at 18, you didn't have it figured out at 18. I didn't have it figured out. So how do you expect somebody at 18 or 22 to have it all figured out? I've never seen it. Even, even, even athletes that go pro, they don't have it all figured out at 18. LeBron James did not have it figured out at 17, 18 years old. Mm -hmm. Kobe Bryant did not have it figured out at 18. Years. Look, so to the parents, please give your students and your student athletes grace. Um, they need time to develop. They need time to get to know themselves um, because you have a, what we're doing is that we end up inviting a lot of student athletes or students into the workforce and we try to train them versus empower them and educate them. There's a difference when you, when you train and say, no, you do exactly the way I did it. But you, when you empower them, you say, okay, you got three or four different ways you can do it. You make the decision. And when we give, when we give our students grace our even our children grace, they blossom. And, and, and I'm just, I'm just a firm believer. The divine is going to pull them where they need to go. Just like at 21, 22, when I graduated undergrad, I thought I wanted to work in corporate. God was like, <laughs> all right, bro, go ahead. Try that. See how much it fulfills you. <laughs> See how much, you know, and again, I'll, I'll be honest. There are some guys, there are some students that I've advised they, they thought they wanted to work on Wall Street. I had a gang of buddies who worked on Wall Street, went to went to Harvard B School, making boatloads of money, just doing well for themselves. making, And that's their thing. Had a student. I said, well, look, go and check out Wall Street. See, see if you like it. He goes, he said, yeah, man, it's cool. Money was good. Work was hard. He said, I hated it. I don't want to do it. So, okay, good. That's all I wanted. That's all I wanted you to get from it. Some people are cut. Some people are cut and meant to do that. Just like you and I both know, certain people are meant to work with young people. Certain mm -hmm. people are not meant. And so uh, if there's anything I say to student athletes, just understand that you do have time. Give yourself grace to develop into the person, not the athlete, the person, not the professional, the person that you are comfortable with presenting to the world and that your children and grandchildren and great grandchildren will be proud to say, you know what, Jonathan Jones. He was that dude. <laughs> That's the focus. That's the focus. You do the best you can. And um, it was something It was. It was in a song. It's, I don't know who sang the song. A hip hop group sampled it, but it says um, there's a life. There's a lesson in every lifetime. Right. Mm. Good, bad or indifferent. And every there's a lesson in every lifetime. You look anybody's obituary or, you know, even as you read people's bios, there's a lesson in there somewhere. <laughs> There's a lesson in there somewhere. I mean, there are people that you and I both know whose 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 lessons over there. I mean, whose lifetime is filled with lessons. And, you know, you just have to be ready to to you just have to be ready. To, you have to you have to anticipate the good, the bad and the ugly, man. And, and just hope that you remain strong, stand. Well, I don't want to say strong. You remain resilient <laughs> and you make the right informed decision when the storm is over. Man. There it is. There it is. Co Coach Rice, I I've certainly, certainly enjoyed our conversation, my good brother. But before I let you go, 
Mm-hmm. I have to run you through the two minute drill. Let's I get just, it. I just have to. So for everybody listening for the first time, the two minute drill ultimately is I'm going to ask a few rapid fire questions and then just going to allow the people just to see a slightly different angle. Then I'm going to let you let people know where they can connect with you. And then we're going to wrap this thing up, put a bow on it and call it a day. Are My you man. ready? Yes, sir. Let's go. All right. Here we go. Favorite food. <sighs> favorite food uh lasagna okay what's the last book you read welcome to management by ryan hawk what's the most underrated cereal oh golden grams no doubt Mm, okay okay what's your go-to streaming show of preference snowfall Mm, okay 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 (laughs) and what what's one tip that you want to leave for a student athlete Find out, research, and ultimately master your learning style. Right. Master your learning style because how you learn translates into how you lead. I'm a firm believer. That's that's what you'll find on my bio and all of my social media, on all of my social media headings. I turn leaders, learners into leaders and leaders into champions. It's just the stage of development. But let me go step back a step further. At some point, every learner was a listener for those who are able to hear. They were either a listener or a responder. So we listen, learn, lead, right? So master your learning style. Once you've mastered your learning style and the time of day that you're the most productive, then life becomes a little more manageable for you. And if you're an early bird or early worm, <laughs> um, know when your golden time of day is. For me, my golden time of day is normally 4.30 a.m. Until, a, until about noon. I crank. That's when I crank. But I'm also a kinesthetic learner. I'm at my best when I'm moving. Right. And I'm doing several different things. So find out. And again, find out what type of learner you are, either visual auditory or kinesthetic we're all three but there's one in particular that stands out so find out what type of learner you are and that will that will translate in the type of leader you are and once you figure out what type of leader you are literally it's every opportunity that you create is based on how you learn and lead Mm, that's good that's good and the bonus question this is after the two minute drill bonus question who's the next guest that you would like to see me interview here on beyond the ball a brother named kyle adams phenomenal scholar phenomenal coach phenomenal father i when he and i get on the phone i gotta have at least two hours to just a just a wealth of knowledge loves student athlete development loves coaching and loves history when i promise you when you sit down with this brother you will get your pen and pad right he's gonna take you down memory lane just on the history um, but just a really solid brother from Philadelphia, West Philadelphia, born and raised with a phenomenal story, man. Phenomenal story, phenomenal father uh, and phenomenal man of God as well. All right. All right. There, there it is. There it is. Coach Rice, let, let the good people know where they can find you, connect with you and find out more about Coach Rice. All social media platforms is at Coach Rice 11 at Coach Rice, R-I-C-E 1-1. And my website is CoachRice.net. There it is. Well, I, like I said, I told you once, and I'm going to tell you again, I appreciate you taking time to hang out with us and really just add the value that you added to the platform today, sir. Brother, I appreciate you. Thank you, man. God bless you. And, and you know, you and your you and your dad um, have been a blessing to me, uh, you know, just on so many levels, not just by what you say, but, you know, I'm watching what you're doing, man. So keep keep doing it. Keep rising. And, and again, thanks for the opportunity to serve. It's, it's, it's an honor and a privilege. Most definitely, my brother. All the ballers out there, if you have not subscribed to the podcast, I would encourage you to take this moment right now and subscribe, subscribe, subscribe on YouTube so you can get the get the visuals, get to see the people when I bring them on uh, and everything like that. And if you feel that this show has added value to you in any way, shape or form, I would love it if you left a rate and review. Just leave a little bit of feedback and then screenshot that thing and then DM it to me. And I would definitely shout you out for the guest of the week. This is Jonathan Jones, and this is Beyond the Ball, where we help you succeed beyond your degree.